Hello, children. Welcome to another edition of Clark TV, brought to you by Mr. Clark. Okay, so today we're talking about the 60s, specifically the movements in the South that are civil rights movements, mainly, again, talking about black-white issues. Um, and yesterday we talked about sit-ins. So this is uh, another example of the sit-ins in Nashville, Tennessee in 1960 and yes period two i know you got this already so stop whining and complaining already uh blah, blah, blah. i heard this before mr clark uh just listen again so um don't sell any twix okay so in nashville 1960 you have uh sit-ins that happen all over different places and they're mostly done by young people and young people can be very easily influenced and they can be taught things well at least most young kids can be taught things and in this case Reverend James Lawson is conducting workshops training nonviolent resistance if you're spit on if you are kicked if you are punched if you are pushed if you are sworn at if you are called names to not respond in the same way to be able to take it non-violently and react as if nothing has happened. This is inspired by a few things. You can trace this to Gandhi and the movements in India um, resisting British colonialism. You'll also see the influence of Christianity uh, with the SCLC that we talked about yesterday uh, led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So in this case, you got another minister, James Lawson, conducting workshops for nonviolent resistance. So students from Fisk and Vanderbilt and other colleges there around Tennessee do the same things that happened in Greensboro with the Greensboro Four um, sitting at the lunch counters and waiting to be served. Arrests will happen and boycotts will start and that will lead to changes. Businesses will decide that they don't want to lose money, and therefore uh, things will be desegregated, and blacks will have the same opportunities that whites do to be served food and uh, beverages at uh, lunch counters. So, with that theme in mind, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee develops. And this is again mostly young. African American, but also white uh, students that join this committee. And this is Ella Baker. She um, is one of the directors here of this uh, SCLC organization that uh, helps students organize this SNCC. So you're gonna remember both of those, both those acronyms. Um, you need to remember. So this one, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And uh, it starts here organizing students uh, at a conference in North Carolina. But there's, there's, there's a generation gap here between the African, -Ameri African Americans as well in the South. There are those that have been accustomed to what ha life has been and what tradition was and what Jim Crow laws were. And they feared change. They feared that it might get worse. And so they didn't necessarily want some of these student uh, protests and uh, uh, activities that that could cause their life to change and, and things to to be negative for them out of uh, these reactions from uh, from the white folk in the south the election of 1960 we talked about this in the last chapter but kennedy wins in a very close election, a slim margin, and so when he defeats Nixon, he doesn't have necessarily the uh, the backing or the power to be able to change things himself. Um, it's met with much resistance, and so the Kennedy administration and civil rights can be defined as this in his short two and a half, three years in office. Um, his younger brother, Bobby Kennedy, is the Attorney General and they take the strategy that there will be very few 
laws that will pass or be attempted to be passed through this Congress uh, and their administration. But they will use as much executive action and power as they can to change things. We're going to look at one of these today in which uh, the, the younger Kennedy, uh, Bobby Kennedy, gets involved uh, with the Freedom Rides. And then also using court injunctions, which then cause these things to be um, decided by the Supreme Court and the Oral War, war in Court that we talked about uh, yesterday as well. So the Freedom Rides, I'm going to show you a little video on this here, but what you can see in the picture is uh, young males, both black and white, that have um, joined this uh, movement uh, known as the Freedom Rides in uh, 1960, early 1961. So they're organized by James Farmer, who becomes the National Director of CORE. This is another one of the big three that you got to remember. So CORE is Congress of Racial Equality. Remember that as one of the major organizations here of black civil rights movements in the South in the 1960s. What they're doing is they're going to test the compliance of the court orders banning segregation in the interstate commerce travel. So if you remember Irene Morgan, in that case, in the late 30s, 1939, said that... Um, buses were going to be desegregated that were crossing uh, state lines. So again, you can see pictures here of uh, all kinds of young people that are going to go on these buses and see if they get arrested or if they're able to ride freely throughout these different states in the south. So May 1961, they're going to start here um, leaving Washington, D.C., and go through Virginia, go through the rest of the South to reach uh, the Deep South in uh, Mississippi. And many things will happen along the way, and uh, I'll let the video explain these things here. I gotta find the video. I'll come back to this. Here we go. By the late 19th century, segregation of blacks and whites had become an entrenched way of life in the South. In December 1960, another Supreme Court ruling declared segregated restrooms, restaurants, and waiting rooms for interstate bus, train, and plane passengers unconstitutional. Five months later, that law would be severely tested Someone by wake up, care me. Riders. The Freedom Rides were organized by James Farmer, director of the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, a civil rights organization rooted in the philosophy of nonviolence. Farmer, who would be arrested with other Freedom Riders, launched the movement to draw attention to the lack of enforcement of recent civil rights court decisions and legislation. As farmers' volunteers rode into the South, the campaign gained support from civil rights leaders like Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King, Jr., when the riders arrived in Atlanta, King praised them for their nonviolent direct action, but he warned of trouble ahead. You'll never make it through Alabama, he predicted. Activist John Lewis, now a congressman from Georgia, was then a 21-year-old divinity student. He was the first of the Freedom Riders to be attacked when he and a fellow white rider tried to enter a whites-only waiting room at a Greyhound terminal in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Traveling deeper into the South, to Mississippi and Alabama, singing spirituals and freedom songs, the writers were met with hostility, arrest, and more violence. One of the most frightening attacks occurred a few miles outside Anniston, Alabama, on May 14, 1961. A Greyhound bus carrying freedom riders was forced off the road by a white mob who stoned and firebombed the bus. The passengers barely escaped the burning vehicle. That same day, Several of the Freedom Riders arriving at the Trailways bus depot in Birmingham suffered savage and bloody assaults. Among several beaten by the Ku Klux Klan was 61-year-old Walter Bergman, a college professor from Detroit. Undaunted, he urged others to join the cause and strike while the iron is hot. His fellow rider, Reverend B. Elton Cox, an outspoken minister from North Carolina, also remained defiant, saying he preferred death to segregation. Jim Swerg, 
a 21-year-old studying to be a congregational minister, was the victim of an ambush attack a week later at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery, Alabama. Screaming, nigger lover, the mob pummeled him, fracturing his teeth and injuring his back. Trained in nonviolence, like his co-writers, he never struck back. As the vicious attacks on the Freedom Riders continued, the National Guard was called out. When hundreds of supporters of the Freedom Rides assembled at Montgomery's First Baptist Church with Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders, an angry mob gathered outside. The National Guard patrolled the besieged church during the long, tense night. At times, however, Lewis recalled, the guards, with their bayoneted rifles, looked like the enemy. With their presence, the violence was quelled, but hostility awaited the riders as they arrived in Jackson. When black riders tried to enter a white waiting room, or white riders tried to use facilities designated for blacks, local police officers ordered them out. If the riders refused to leave, they were immediately arrested and charged with breach of peace. As the Freedom Riders were taken into custody in Jackson, they did not resist. Some bailed out of jail, but many, in a show of commitment to their cause, refused to be bailed out. The jail, no bail tactic adopted by scores of those arrested would burden Mississippi's penal system for months. Here's Martin Luther King Jr. Never in the history of this nation have so many people been arrested for the cause of freedom and human dignity. While hundreds of freedom riders endured hot, dirty prison cells, civil rights leaders appealed to Washington. Attorney General Robert Kennedy had hoped for a quick end to the protest and especially the violence. Finally, Kennedy pressured the Interstate Commerce Commission, the agency that regulated interstate travel, to issue a new and stronger ruling banning segregated facilities. The ruling went into effect on November 1, 1961. It would still be many years before segregation would end completely, but the Freedom Riders had won a major battle in the war against racism. There you have it. Make sure uh, everybody's awake. Let's go back to the notes. So here, what they explain in the video, Freedom Rides. Riders are attacked in Anniston, Alabama. Alabama. On May 14th, 1961. And there's a famous picture here to the right. Again, this is originally core-sponsored. Um, and that ends here on May 17th. And then they continue through the SNCC. And if you want to just write that, since you already know what it is, uh, because you're such great students, then you can skip that first part. But most of you probably already wrote it down, and now you're upset. Um, the Freedom Rides began again May 20th, 1961. When they get to Birmingham, they're attacked by a white mob, as you can see here in the picture to the right, and what the video showed you as well. So I'll give you a second to write that down. Uh, one second. Uh, a threat to international prestige. We've talked about this before, so again, you're looking at what is not free in this democracy at this time um, and how it looks to um, other countries during the Cold War. Okay, so here's the compromise that they explained as well. The Attorney General, Bobby Kennedy, and the U.S. Senator from Mississippi, James Eastland decide that there will be no interference with the Freedom Riders being arrested when they arrive. So Kennedy agrees to that as long as there is no violence and they become uh, arriving safely. That once he guarantees that, then they're allowed to continue. Once they get off the bus, they're thrown in jail uh, in Jackson, Mississippi. Hurry up and write it down. Yes, we're waiting for you. Okay, here we go. Blank screen. The effects. Mm, this was also explained in the video. The ICC, remember them? Um, International Commerce Commission. Um, 
they get to regulate anything that is interstate commerce, uh, the first uh, federal regulatory agency, and uh, it prohibits segregation on interstate buses. It was already established here, now looking for a real enforcement of that. So by creating a crisis, the Freedom Riders force the federal government into action. And this will be also a pattern. When there is a reaction, when things look bad on TV, uh, when there is public outcries, when there is support for these movements on a national scale, then the government does something about it. So the federal government's unwillingness to enforce laws in the past will be tested, but the pattern has been that they're not willing to do anything unless there is some sort of crisis. So in some cases it reinforces this white resistance to desegregation. When you make a law, like no eating in class, and then Mr. Clark does not enforce it, then it spreads. Just like Shannon eating an apple every day and snacks, eating whatever he eats because he snacks. Civil rights activists recognize the limits of moral persuasion alone to affect change in society. So this is saying, if you want people to change, just by showing them and telling them, uh, that's not going to be enough. If you have ways in which you can force a change, then you might get something quicker to change. All right, here's one of the considered failures for uh, Martin Luther King. 1961 and 62, these same kinds of protests and activities happen um, in Georgia, where Martin Luther King is from. And these mass protests do not see any real white violence in response to them. And so, from this last thing that we just talked about, if there is no need to change or no need to enforce by the federal government these changes, then nothing happens. And so this is a case of that in Albany, Georgia. There, there's no major reaction, so nothing happens. Nothing happens as change. There are arrests made, but no mob violence. And this is considered a defeat for Martin Luther King and the movement. However, it's only one area, um, but this has some traction with the truth of what I just told you before. Um, as if the government doesn't see a need by some sort of national crisis, then nothing is enforced or nothing is done. Birmingham, Alabama, 1963. This is the governor, George Wallace, and he is running for re-election as well. What we talked about before is politics and the problems and evils of politics and how the need for things to be done for you to be re-elected sometimes um, can be a negative impact on society. So he says within a speech, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. So the people of Alabama that are voting want segregation, and he knows that. Uh, he's later going to run for president, and we'll talk about his impact on um, the future um, presidential elections here in the late 60s. So um, Birmingham, as a well-known racist um, chief that is uh, going to be tested by the civil rights uh, activists and, and Martin Luther King and others really uh, head this at, in Birmingham. So what they're going to do is they're going to confront this uh, police commissioner, Eugene Connor, and his nickname was Bull. And somebody with a nickname of Bull usually doesn't take any bull from anybody. So I'm going to show you a video here on what happens in Birmingham in 1963 as the civil rights activists confront this uh, this man. Uh, the jails will be filled, and that is a strategy. They know that this is going to happen. They want that to happen because then it brings awareness, and so far it's brought change. And then they will use an economic boycott. We've seen this happen. So far, those have had... Uh, effects on, on change in uh, 
local areas. Okay, here's the video. In April 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. headed to Birmingham, Alabama to join in an anti-segregation march. By now, he was a national figure, often called in to lend his influence in local freedom struggles. The city of Birmingham had plenty of moderate white citizens, but they were used to keeping quiet. Many feared the violence of the Ku Klux Klan. The Klan had helped elect a white racist named Eugene Bull Connor as Birmingham's police chief. To put a stop to civil rights demonstrations, Connor sent attack dogs. All you gotta do is tell them you're gonna bring the dogs. Look at them run. I wanna see the dogs work. Martin Luther King was tired as he arrived in Birmingham, but there was a feeling of excitement in the air, as if a breakthrough were about to happen. Then, Bull Connor's police moved in to arrest Dr. King. He knelt beside one of the police motorcycles and said a prayer. Then he was taken off to jail. There he wrote a passionate and angry letter to explain the reasons behind the civil rights movement. He didn't have any writing paper, so he wrote on the margins of a newspaper and on toilet paper. Your first name becomes nigger. Your middle name becomes boy, however old you are. Then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. King's letter from a Birmingham jail was an indictment of American society for permitting racism to continue. But it ended with hope. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation. Because the goal of America is freedom. He we talked about America. freedom as the American ideal. And then turned around and said, well, now blacks want to be part of that. He was asking white Americans, in a sense, to finally, after hundreds of years, confront this contradiction. They believed in freedom, and yet they denied freedom to African Americans. Which was their true self? In a sense, asking white America, are you Bull Connor, or are you someone who believes in human rights? Forcing people to make a choice in a non-threatening manner. On Friday, May 3rd, a new march took place in Birmingham. This time it included more than a thousand students and young people. One of them was Patricia King. Some of the times that we marched, people would be out there and they would throw rocks and cans and different things at us. I was afraid of getting hurt, but still I was willing to march to see justice done. Once again, Bull Connor called out his forces. Firemen turned on high-pressure hoses. When the water hit people, they were thrown on the ground and rolled screaming down the street. Police dogs bit three teenagers so badly, they had to be taken to the hospital. Seventy-five children were squeezed into a cell built for eight prisoners. Television cameras capture what was happening to Birmingham's children. Most hadn't realized how bad things were for blacks in the segregated South. But now, they saw it for themselves. Okay, so let's, you don't have to write this down here, but this is some of that that they explain in the video. As he writes the letter from Birmingham, yeah, you may want to, let's let's write it down. Let's write down just write down the letter from Birmingham City Jail. Um, and the first one, 
the first uh, quotation is good. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So that becomes a, a signifying statement here by uh, Martin Luther King. Um, the second quotation, weight, it rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This weight has almost always meant never. You can sense the frustration here with Dr. King as he goes from place to place and he's organizing all of these things and he's thrown in jail time and time again and uh, you can get you can get the anger and the frustration from from this letter uh, but he's still holding to the nonviolence that's that's key to his message that's key to the successes that they've had and so uh, there's a little turning point within this but it's still stressing um, nonviolence here, you don't have to write this down. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustice are alive. So finding out, yes, is there something we can do? Negotiation with those in which are the oppressors. Three, self-purification. And then direct action. Um, and then the second one, nonviolent direct action, seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. And TV is essential to the understanding here of um, the rest of the country and the rest of the world, what's going on in the South. So just like slavery before the Civil War, um, and does anybody remember what that was? Yes, antebellum society. Good. So um, in that, when we talked about the 50s, 1850s, and the exposure of all of these former slaves, that uh, all of the, the books that are writing about uh, slavery, slavery as it is, um, the Grimke sisters, uh, Frederick Douglass, and then that influential book, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe, really brings to life to people what the South was actually like. Um, and here, TV, again, does the same thing. It shows what's happening in the South to people that maybe don't know really what's going on. And it brings it into their living room, and it brings it in not just one time, but over and over and over again um, throughout the years of the uh, 50s, late 50s and early 60s. So in the video they explain the Children's Crusade and that the younger people being treated the same way uh, by the police through their peaceful protests, marching through streets, um, brings out water hoses and dogs um, to disrupt their their protest. Okay, so the SCLC agreed to end protests if businesses desegregate. The KKK is still a major force in fear uh, tactics, uh, lynchings, um, bombings, all kinds of things that uh, are terrorizing the South. So the SCLC uh, headquarters are bombed by the KKK. The ones that in Birmingham, not the there's different headquarters around different states. Uh, some riots break out in which JFK responds by sending three thousand troops to restore order. Again, you see the process here and what Martin Martin Luther King was talking about. You create a crisis. You have to, uh, a response by the by the federal government. September 1963, the 16th, uh, Street, 16th Street Baptist Church is bombed, killing four young girls. I'll show you a little video on this as well. Here's the, the four girls. Stay awake. battleground of the civil rights era was Birmingham. In the early 1960s, the town was a racial powder keg waiting to explode. Birmingham was then the most segregated city in America, and it had the longest history of aggressive racial violence. Birmingham was called Bombingham by people in the civil rights movement because of this long chain of unsolved bombings of black homes. 
much of the violence was perpetrated by the Ku Klux Klan. As evidenced in the beating of the Freedom Riders, the city's law enforcement was known for its working relationship with the Klan. The Klan had uh, more influence perhaps in Birmingham than they did uh, in a lot of the other southern cities, and I think that uh, contributed to the Klan's sense of bravado, where they felt like they could get away with anything, that nobody would hold them accountable. In this charged atmosphere, one of the cruelest of all acts of Klan terror occurred. The 16th Street Baptist Church was a symbol of the civil rights movement in Birmingham. The sacred chamber served as a staging point for demonstrations against segregated downtown public facilities. From the steps of the church, hundreds of black marchers, most of them kids, encountered the extreme force of police commissioner Bull Connor's attack dogs and high-pressure fire hoses. For radical segregationists like the Klan, the 16th Street Baptist Church became a special target. On a hazy Sunday morning in September of 1963, Four young black girls attended Sunday school at the 16th Street Church. The day's Bible lesson was, A Love That Forgives. The four girls moved to the basement to don choir robes when suddenly a noise shot through the church like a cannon. A bomb planted near the basement ripped through the house of worship. Under an avalanche of shattered glass, toppled brick, and tangled metal, a gruesome discovery. Cynthia Wesley, age 14. Carol Robertson, age 14. Addie Mae Collins, age 14. And Denise McNair, age 11. All were found dead. Their bodies buried atop one another. Of all the bad things that happened uh, in the South during the uh, Civil Rights era, to me, that was uh, the worst. Because you had four innocent little girls that hadn't done anything to anybody going to worship on Sunday morning uh, in church and, uh, and they're killed for absolutely no reason except that they are, were black. Within days, police were almost certain the bombers were members of the United Clans of America. The key suspect was Dynamite Bob Chambliss, a Klansman suspected in many Birmingham bombings. After a perfunctory investigation, Chambliss and two other Klansmen were convicted only of the minor charge of dynamite possession. That finding was overturned on appeal. An FBI investigation resulted in no arrest, no charges. Alright, so extremely sad here with these four young girls being the victims of terrorism. Alright, so JFK televised speech June 11th, 1963. Yes, he, anybody remember the day in which he dies? November 22nd, 1963. Okay, so this is the summer here before that. He's calling on Congress to enact comprehensive law to ensure voting rights and outlaw segregation in public facilities. Okay, remember the strategy, not through law, but through executive action, um, is how he's going to push the agenda of civil rights. After this televised speech, Medgar Evers is shot in his driveway. Uh, he's the one of the NAACP chapter leaders in Mississippi. So, uh, again... People have problems, and uh, they take it out on others. And this happened to be, uh, again, the KKK, which was implicated um, in this uh, murder. All right, the March on Washington. This is August 28, 1963. Um, Coalition of Civil Rights Groups. This one's going to be on your quiz. Um, and... They want to have a unified message, but there has been some differences here amongst these different groups. 
SCLC, S, uh, CNC, and Core, and some other uh, groups that, that don't have necessarily the same vision uh, of nonviolence that, that King has. So what they wanted to present was a unified message. And JFK is reluctant to have this happen here uh, on the steps of Lincoln, uh, the memorial of Lincoln looking out um, towards uh, the Washington uh, Memorial. The purpose of the unified message was to uh, have African Americans be free and be able to get jobs. So jobs and freedom become the cry of uh, the crowds here in, in Washington. This is the a famous I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King. And I also have a dream that you will pass the APUSH exam. That's really Mark Wahlberg. Thought this was funny. So you don't have to write this down, but this is uh, my favorite part here of the of the speech. I have dreamed that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will be not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. How profound that statement is, and uh, if we could live by that, it would be a much better place. Let me show you this. Well, actually, we may not have time for that. Okay, you can look it up on your own. Um, 24th Amendment outlaws the poll taxes that are in the South. Okay, so JFK's speech here um, about making sure that all African Americans have the right to vote, uh, this helps that lead to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So now JFK is dead and it will be up to Lyndon B. Johnson to push this uh, agenda of civil rights uh, through his presidency. So LG, uh, LBJ's role is uh, very active within this uh, passing of the Civil Rights Act. This will also be on your quiz. What it does is outlaws discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It authorizes the Justice Department to initiate suits to desegregate public schools. It provides technical and financial aid to communities to desegregate schools. So it's giving the opportunity, the funding for this to happen uh, on a large scale and uh, happen in an effective, efficient manner. Created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission EEOC, um, another acronym to remember. Uh, you don't have to specifically remember this one, though. This is the signing. You can see uh, Dr. King back here and LBJ of signing this uh, monumental legislation that is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Remember that it's Lyndon B. Johnson signing it. It's not JFK. Many people missed this on the quiz and on the test. It is L.B.J. Lyndon B. Johnson that signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Bye. We'll talk about this tomorrow. Peace.